So have you guys been enjoying yourselves so far? Yeah. Yeah? Some good stuff happening? Alright, obviously you've already heard from me once before, but I'm going to take off my running GMX hat and put on my I've released an independent game hat. Uh, our game is out there, it's called Uncle Slam. Uh, this panel is uh, with me, Uncle Slam. This is Tom, he made Square Shooters. We're going to talk a little bit about kind of what Steve started on in his last, uh, in last talk here, which is running a gaming business. Um, you know, a lot of the people who are here and a lot of the people that are, uh, you know, in the Cleveland Game Developers Group, we've made a lot of cool games, but what happens when you actually want to start making money with that hobby of yours? Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I didn't bring any slides, but Tom's going to have some slides about square shooters in a few minutes. But uh, with Uncle Slam, the idea came to us randomly one day. Um, it's a presidential boxing game, basically. It's for iOS, uh, iPhone, and iPad. And what this game is was... The concept was, what if presidents could just punch each other in the face? Seems pretty simple. Seems like a pretty good idea, right? Who doesn't want to punch a politician in the face? From conception to release, took us probably about a year and a half. Uh, it is a, what we like to think of as a pretty full-featured game. It started as, um, at first we wanted to do kind of Mortal Kombat style, where it would be bloody and angry and whatever, and then we started thinking, well, we're going to have the actual president in this game. That might not be the smartest way to go. So we ended up taking it in a more cartoon direction. Um, it's all gestural, swiping based. And, you know, we basically built it using, you know, to get sort of low level for a second, it's built obviously in Objective-C because that's what iOS apps are written in, but it uh, uses Cocos 2D for the graphics and Box 2D is the physics engine it's built upon it. That's of interest to anybody. Um, and we had two full-time artists two full-time programmers, as well as a bunch of part-timers doing things like audio mixing, uh, voiceover recording, as well as a composer who we contracted to write the songs. And like I said, it took us about a year and a half from conception to delivery. Now, we were not necessarily fully indie in that we actually did have a little bit of money to play with. Um, it was you know, money that we got from making our other apps, and as well as um, some very, very limited investment money, but it was not a publisher. So by that, you know, sort of measure, we were still considered an indie game. And some of the challenges that we faced immediately was the fact that we thought we were releasing a game in the traditional model. You build a game, you set a price, and then you sell it. <laughs> it hit the store right about the time when that model was starting to fall apart. And free to play was becoming the way that you do things on mobile. Um, and so as a result, we released our game for $4.99, which for anybody who's got an Android or an iPhone, you know, the idea of somebody spending $4.99 on an app, they all of a sudden are like, oh my god, $4.99, that's ridiculous, that's so expensive, ah, ah, ah. Meanwhile, they're sipping on their $6.99, you know, half-calf skim latte that they just picked up at Starbucks. And this is the unfortunate truth of what we're living in in the sort of mobile game development market right now, is convincing people to give you money up front, as small as it may be, you're just a buck, is a tricky proposition these days. So as a result, what we did with Uncle Slam was, um, I forgot to start recording. Close enough. So what we did with Uncle Slam was we released it for $4.99, realized pretty quickly that we were not getting a lot of sales, and we decided to switch the model. And so what we did was we took the original version, we had, already, we had always sort of planned on having in-app purchase be a part of the model, that we would release it with a certain number of presidents and then you'd be able to add on more. The goal being that as we sold more copies of the game, that revenue we could pour back into making new, new characters who could then be purchased and downloaded. Um, and we ran out of money, as will happen with indie games uh, uh, oftentimes. We got about halfway through the roster of presidents and we're just out of money at this point. It's still for sale. And we're still, you know, hoping to build enough revenue that we can start building more characters for the game. But unfortunately, that just hasn't happened at this point. Um, it's, like I said, it's available for both iPhone and iPad. And we do have some really diehard fans. You know, we get a lot of people who request new presidents every week. We're getting three or four emails. Oh, I would really love it if you put Teddy Roosevelt in. Or I'd really love it if you put Ronald Reagan in. Um, and, you know, part of the model that we built it around was... If we did all of the banner presidents, all of the Ronald Reagans and the Bushes and you know the Kennedys right up front, nobody's going to buy the you know the Pierce or the Harrison or you know or all of the sort of no-name presidents that people don't really remember from history. So we sort of took our plan of well we would 
do some no names and some banners, and we broke it all down into the packs that we were going to build. We only got through two of them out of five. Such is life. So um, the challenge that we're dealing with now is what, when is it that you say, I'm done with this game. I'm not going to put any more money into it. We've kind of gotten to that point now. Like I said, it's still for sale. If it does what it needs to do, we will, you know, continue to grow it. But, you know, kind of like what Ian was talking about at the very beginning and what, um, you know, Steve hit on a little bit in his talk, sometimes you have to build a lot of games before you get one that is a hit. Um, you know, the first game that you're going to do right out the door is probably not going to be a hit. Even if you put marketing dollars and other kinds of things behind it, it might just not be as good as you thought it was going to be. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with, with Uncle Slam. Um, we're still growing it, we're still doing some other things, but we're probably not going to put a lot more time into it. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say about Uncle Slam. I'm going to let Tom tell you a little bit about Square Shooters, and then we'll sort of do a little bit of back and forth about some businessy questions, and if you guys have questions, we'll take those as well. All right, so Tom, let's talk about Square Shooters. All right, thanks Jeremy, and thanks everyone for coming. So I'm Tom Donnellan, I'm President and CEO of Heartland Consumer Products. We are based in Lakewood, and we are sort of backing into this whole digital game design and development world. I have a 25 year career in consumer products. I used to sell duct tape and uh, do global sourcing uh, for adhesives, and was working at Shears Foods selling potato chips and tortilla chips. I'm sure to a lot of gamers uh, through the years, but here ended up um, owning a consumer products company, and what we know how to do is deliver to retail. Uh, and we're, we're so good at it that um, there's a lot of things that we just never knew or understood about the digital opportunity relative to our business. We signed a property about uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago now, and I'm going to actually finish, I've got a few slides just to illustrate the business context of what we're doing in digital today. And I'll kind of finish with a little bit of an explanation of our, of our real roots and the things that I tend to think about every day are Walmart and Walgreens and uh, we just landed Target. We've got a little game that hangs actually in the game department in 15,000 stores nationwide. And we're so focused on the supply chain and on the retail business of this that when we conceived the project and the idea of hey, we've got to be digital, we've got to have a mobile game, we've got to be on the iPhone, we got started. We hired a project manager, actually found a volunteer project manager, and I was on the phone with him one day, I don't think I told Jeremy the story, and um, I, you know, we were talking about our iPhone game, and he mentioned uh, something called iOS. True story, this was last uh, April, I had no idea what iOS was. I, had to, I didn't say anything to the guy, I got home and Googled it <laughs> to find out that it's actually the operating system, Jeremy, that runs the iPhone. So just here we are with a really cool property and a great idea. And I think to Ian's point, we're marketers. We're mass retail marketers. We have a game and an opportunity to reach a large segments of the population with a very historical and popular play pattern. But we don't have the design, the creativity, the knowledge, the technical skill to do it. We just said, damn it, we're doing it. We brought the property to retail. We brought it to uh, iPhone. Jeremy joined us as uh, really a project manager, product manager, design consultant that has really helped us, really helped us uh, uh, avoid a lot of mistakes. So now here we are as a publisher of both a retail game and an iPhone game. And let me just tell you a little bit about it so that um, I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the business of what we're doing and a little bit about our property. Uh, just enough, hopefully, to stoke you guys with some questions. So the first thing I want to tell, uh, share with everyone, this was published in Wired Magazine just about three or four weeks ago. Um, the red bar is um, a chart showing different, uh, the, the percent of activities that people enjoy on their mobile phone. So it's a little tough to read, but the top, uh, the top red bar, which is covered by a blue bar, is for playing games. Playing games, social networking, down in the bottom is getting news, email is right there in the middle. There are a lot of things people do on, on a phone, right? So as a percent of activity, gameplay at the top is just about as common as checking a social media site. What's compelling about this stat, though, is the blue bar, uh, the blue bar tells us about engagement, which is the percent of time that a person spends 
uh, using their phone. And here gaming is dominant. And this gentleman said, uh, Kevin Chow said, on mobile devices there are games and there are everything else. That was the title of the article. 60% of the time spent on a mobile de device is not uh, spent making phone calls. It's spent um, playing games. So mobile is about gaming. That's lesson number one. Lesson two is, in a room full of creativity and all sorts of gaming genres, there's a tried and true favorite that's been around for an awful long time, and that's casino gaming. Cards and dice are, they're part of our DNA as human beings and gamers. Games of chance are the root of so many things. And so even when you look within social casino gameplay, a full 25% of all games that are making money in the App Store and Google Play are actually social casino games. It's a remarkable stat because they're sort of, you're not reading, you're reading about Angry Birds, you're hearing about, um, you know, different games that, that, that come out, but, but not casino and card games. They're, they're boring, right? There's a ton of them. There's 150,000 card and dice games in the App Store. It sort of, uh, it, just, it just proves the point that it's just quietly what a lot of people do. It shouldn't be so a surprise. There's a city in, uh, in our country called Las Vegas that people flock to to play these types of games. Within social casino, what really drives uh, that industry, that business, is the sort of slots and bingo dynamic. Poker is clearly a big part of it, uh, blackjack craps, but so many people don't know how to bet or don't understand or want to be as in-depth in terms of the seriousness of some of those play patterns. But this sort of point and click, you know, that random chance, oh, did I get it or not? You know, slots and bingo drive it. Think about it. How many folks here have been to the horseshoe downtown or to a casino anywhere on earth? So a lot of folks and, you know, the number one floor space commitment is for what? Slot machines. So that's what's most popular and, and it's what's driving, as and you can tell, the shelf space that these, these are the most popular social casino applications on the market and they dedicate their front door to bingo and to slots. So here we are. What we have is Cards on Dice, and I'll get to describing what makes Cards on Dice special in a minute. But we designed our iPhone game to appeal to the slots and bingo player. We didn't design it to appeal to the poker player. And we did it for a reason, and the reason is that all this stuff. So it's um, fresh yet familiar, right? Words with friends is Scrabble. We think our game is Yahtzee, except a more authentic poker matching dynamic than uh, the five decade favorite. And we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, it's a very mass friendly game. This is not something you need to be a Rhodes Scholar. You can open our app and start to play. It's very simple. You're just getting an assignment and you have three rolls of some dice to match the card. So. Back to not being a game designer, what we are are marketers, and we decided to take cards on dice, which are infinitely familiar to people, even though they're only recently existing and recently patented, and we created a play pattern using Yahtzee, which is the most familiar play pattern in dice gaming on earth. So we did the game design, but we did it by sort of stealing shamelessly and understanding what people already love to do. We felt that what Zenga did with Words with Friends was a pretty good strategy, copying an age-old favorite like uh, Scrabble. What we're finding is that here on the left are some statistics from uh, the Casual Game Association that show age and um, demographics related to slots and bingo. And these are our stats. What you're seeing here, the two tall charts are we're engaging players from 25 to 54. It's not a game for young people. And it's 61% women, which is a direct match on the core slot player dynamic. What's really exciting is in mobile, and this is a key business lesson for us and for everyone in the room, is that the mobile industry, at least our part of the industry, is depending on day one retention of only 40%. Day one, you want 40% of your players to return again. Uh, we're very proud to announce that as of this month and being three months on the market, we're crushing that statistic at 55%. What's really awesome is that day seven, the industry is only hoping for 10% of its players to return, and 25% of our players are returning. Believe it or not, a lot of companies have built business models at day 30 and so on, retaining only six to 10% of their players. 
Uh, these are our session counts, so it's proving that the people that are playing the game are playing it frequently. This is a day count, and they're playing it very smoothly throughout their, their tenure, up to six to, to eight sessions per day. So what have we done? We've, we've done nothing yet except express a very popular and well-selling retail game as a digital game. We still haven't really unlocked the full business benefit of being on a mobile platform. And we're looking to do that next. So what makes our game special? And, you know, it's just a quick story, but Dice have been around for a little more than 8,000 years. They could be the world's oldest game platform. And by platform, I mean you can do a lot of different things with Dice. Playing cards are probably the world's best-selling game platform of all time. And if you had a patent on either item, you would own a community of gaming from everything from Go Fish, Uno is based upon Crazy Eights, which you can play with a deck of cards, to Yahtzee, to the whole city of Las Vegas. I think if you had a patent on either cards or dice, you'd probably be up here you know, telling the rest of us how to get things done. Um, we actually are fortunate enough to have a patent on the next best thing. What Square Shooters is, it is a set of nine dice that have 54 collective surfaces. That's 52 cards plus two jokers. And they are patented with an arrangement that allows for uh, ev the achievement of every possible rummy hand and poker hand. Uh, every possible four of a kind, every rummy run, every straight flush, every, every uh, royal flush. So it's better shown in person, um, but the point is you can use dice to achieve the goals of the most popular card games of all time. When someone buys a deck of cards, we actually, our legacy business is actually selling playing cards. 65% of the time they're either playing a rummy game or a poker game. And so the fact that these dice can unlock those achievements really allows us to unlock and replicate the most popular play patterns in history uh, using dice. So our game is doing well, not because we're great marketers, in fact we're not, it's doing well. We didn't invent the game by the way, so when I brag about it, I'm bragging about a grandma from Illinois who uh, is empty nest, who had this great idea, she did the 9 times 6 is 54 math and then got busy creating an algorithm on little wooden blocks uh, and earned a patent two years ago on the combination, she's, a, she's brilliant. But card and di cards and dice are at the root of our gameplay psyche, uh, co combining cards onto dice. You know, I tell people, d d cards were invented, playing cards were invented in the ninth or tenth, let's say, let's say it was uh, the year, uh, you know, 998. I, cards on dice should have been invented in 999, you know, it just, they were meant for each other and that it took so long is one of those, you know, should have, I should have thought of that ideas. Um, again, again, with a product, and, and you can literally do almost anything with these dice, when you're thinking about any game, mobile or in our case retail, people, people don't want to buy the idea of infinity. They want to buy something they can do in 20 or 30 minutes. That's especially true in the board game tabletop market. So we had to we knew we had to do something with these dice besides just say, hey, here, you guys go re rewrite the Book of Hoyle. That was one thing we could have done but we decided to create a particular game to feature the game, the dice. That has its disadvantages. You have to pick the right game to feature. You have to do the marketing. You have to talk out of both sides of your mouth. Hey, we've got this great game. Hey, you can do anything with the dice. But in any case, the game we picked was to sort of replicate Yahtzee. And as I've told you, we think we, we made a good decision there. Um, in terms of our game design, onboarding, UI, everything's clean, natural, simple, friendly. Uh, very intuitive gameplay. Those are some things we think we did well. A lot of those la those last three points came with the help of Jeremy and his team at Handelabra. So anyway, if I haven't made the point, we've got more than just one game. We've got this platform of patent and game copyrights that we have under development. And we feel like we've got this opportunity across retail, digital, uh, even casino, commercial applications. Uh, just. You know, we can, these are all dice and card games. We feel that we can create a version of one day. Uh, after we succeed with one, we feel like we've got this long tail of opportunity. Um, the final thing I want to mention is the other thing that makes us special is that we are in 15,000 stores nationwide. I did start with that comment, but it is an advantage that we have on both fronts. You know, the digital game folks we've met and encountered say, oh my gosh, this is great. 
it's so hard to make money in digital. It's a good thing you've got the, the retail business. And on the retail side, all those game makers say is, boy, it's, it's so hard to make money over here. It's a good thing you got the digital thing. So I can report that we're doing a great job of losing money at both right now. So, um, uh, But we are very proud to uh, stick QR codes into, uh, we've sold over 200,000 real world copies. We are in Walmart and Walgreens, alive and well. Um, Kmart as of past, this past holiday, and we just found out last week we've landed Target. So we bring this opportunity to have a transmedia business. Um, you know, we can achieve a retail sale, we can cross market and reach into digital consumers. We can uh, do some marketing within our app. We're doing self-marketing of our retail game. Um, this here. This is an ad that'll pop up, an interstitial ad between turns, telling people they can buy the real thing at Walmart. If they click it, they can do and go to a web-based store locator. So we're, we're, we're just beginning to understand how to cross-market uh, both the real world and the digital world. And, you know, transmedia is a big term, but it's what's happening. It's what people are doing. If, if, if I, We were just at, in New York City at the International Trade uh, Toy Fair. And what's dominating gaming at retail is Angry Birds and Words with Friends. So, so, so licensing and bringing properties has become more than just entertainment brands like, uh, you know, like Disney coming down into uh, some some Disney game on shelf at Walmart. Now it's now it's about digital game brands that have enormous numbers of eyeballs coming down into Walmart and uh, and, and Target, and they're selling really really well. Well, this is where we're starting. We have those customers. We have this digital opportunity, and so our opportunity is to is to start where uh, where the industry is going. And the final thing I'll say is that as we talk through the business and the unique business issues that we have, please stop by afterward, drop off a business card, take one of ours. One thing we know is that we're consumer products experts. We're not digital game design experts. Uh, we don't know where this is going to go, but what we do know is we need to meet as many folks as we can. In Cleveland, in greater Cleveland, Northeast Ohio, we intend to build a long-term gaming powerhouse. And... Uh, you know, right now we're just uh, we're out there looking for partners, looking for investors, looking for uh, potentially one day you know designers, animators, sound experts, things like that. So please stop by and say hello. Just to give some of the numbers that Tom was talking about a little bit of context as well. Um, you know, obviously a lot of what we've already talked about today with Ian and some of these other kinds of things is very much. Um, wouldn't it be great to come up with this cool gaming concept? Let's paper prototype a game in the back. But as you could hear from what Tom was talking about, if you really want to make a go at this as a business opportunity, something that's more than a hobby, something where you want to make money, there's a ton of other stuff that goes into it beyond simply just coming up with a great game. You know, as Tom said, he didn't make this game. Somebody else made this game. He came in to try and build it out as a brand that can be at retail, that can be on digital, that can be in all these sorts of areas. And and, you know, it's it's another big piece of the puzzle. You know, it's one of the things that we're trying to do here with GMX. Like, it's one thing to sit down and make a great game. It's another thing to actually sell that. You know, it's it's probably what I would consider to be our biggest failing with Uncle Slam. You know, we made what we consider to be a really great game. Um, it's fun. I like to play it. We priced it wrong. We marketed it wrong. We targeted it wrong. And as a result, we're not really making a lot of money. Um, in the indie game world, sometimes you can do all those things wrong. And if your game is just that good, it will take off on its own. But um, if you really want to just sit down and say, let's make something that's actually going to be a successful gaming brand, you know, there's a ton of research that needs to be done. You know, there's a ton of, you know, some of the things like he was talking about uh, conversion rates and some other kinds of things. With Uncle Slam, our conversion rates um, from, you know, since we've gone free to play, like if people want to talk about free to play, what that you know sort of model is built on is this idea that you give the game away for free and if people like it they will then give you money and in the industry as I understand it what is considered to be pretty good conversion rate of people that actually start giving you money is somewhere in the one at one percent so for every 100 people that download and try your game only one of them is probably going to give you money Uncle Slam actually sits at around two and a half percent which is pretty good but our volume is so low that it's not, we're not making tons of money from it. Um, you know, if we could get those volumes up, then the, then those percentages start to make sense. You know, the reason why places like Zenga make money is because they have millions and millions and millions and millions of people playing their games. And then, as a result, 
that one or two percent translates into millions of dollars of revenue. So, yep. And I, just to play off of what Jer Jeremy said there is conversion rates. We, right now, our game is it's free to play. It's designed strictly to be a cross marketing, uh, you know, something that, that sort of we actually was conceived to be a, our chief marketing effort for our physical game. So again, in terms of being backwards, you couldn't have a better person up here. It was only midway through the project we realized, oh my gosh, we're really actually launching a whole new business here, and that that game is going to need its own marketing budget and its own solutions and its own ways to make money and we were fortunate we, we actually did design the game with the, the inventor designed these dice but we when we designed the way this game plays we designed it with a certain texture a certain uh, car, game card turning dynamic that lends itself to being played either the way we wrote the rules or five or six different ways and so when we look ahead and see how are we going to make money or how is our digital division going to make money we envision it being selling extra dice rolls buying certain game cards that provide you with some special features buying uh, a blue set of dice or, or a, a golden uh, dice cup, you know, those are the one percent, two percent. You're converting somebody to sort of buy an accessory, but we really feel that the way our game is designed, by accident, it's ideal for mobile because because since we can play, or you can play the game in different ways, we have this opportunity to in introduce game levels, uh, di different gameplay options, and introduce uh, sort of to, to gamify the game is the industry term to build in. Uh, a layer on top of the game that's based upon earning currency, uh, generating achievements, giving you the ability to work farther and unlock different ways to play. That's where we see our opportunity to actually make money on Square Shooters once we graduate from strictly being a cross-marketing solution. Now again, we don't know how to do that. We know conceptually what needs to be done. We know conceptually how the industry is encouraging players to keep coming back and to play and try to achieve. So we're confident that there's enough knowledge out there, but that's what we're looking constantly to add to our team. Also, one other thing I did want to mention, because Tom used the buzzword, the transmedia. Um, I'm sure, who here has heard about Skylanders? You guys know what Skylanders is? Right. So, you know, Tom is, uh, with Square Shooters, is at a pretty interesting place here because he's got the sort of physical game on the one side and then the digital game on the other side. And a lot of these larger brands are realizing that that crossing of, of the streams, if you will, is where a lot of money is to be made these days. Um, you know, on the software side, I've heard it said that software is an infinite resource. Um, you know, there's always new cool ideas. There's always new gameplay mechanics. There's always new stuff there. But on the physical side, you know, there's a whole supply chain management, all this other kind of stuff that you have to worry about. You need, uh, you need startup capital. You need, you know, manufacturing and all the rest of it. And the industry a lot is moving towards bringing those two things together. You know, with Skylanders, you buy a character, then that character becomes something you can use in your digital game. Disney is going to be throwing their hat in that ring. Um, come, I think it was supposed to be June, but they ended up just pushed it back to August with um, Disney Infinity, which is going to allow you to use like Pixar characters, Disney characters and you buy the figurines it's obviously it's aimed at kids who like to have the little pieces of plastic um, and then you use those to bring things into the digital realm and I think you know if you want to look at an interesting place to be this this sort of crossing of the physical with the digital is where a lot of really interesting things are going to start happening in the next few years because You've got that software as an infinite resource, but you also want to have something that, like Tom was saying, you know, you want kids to be able to walk into a Toys R Us and see something to buy. You know, if everything becomes completely digital, um, you know, we have we've already seen a lot of, you know, the mom and pop retailers are going out of business because you know Amazon's putting them out of, you know, even that physical stuff is being shipped so much. We live so much of our lives online. Bringing it back down into this sort of, I can walk into a store and buy something physical is where a lot of things are going to be going. I Thing. Would you agree? Yes. I also want to point out that a lot of big companies and small companies have tried transmedia stuff. And I just read an article that I can't unfortunately quote, but 90% uh, of those efforts failed. Some of them included big players like uh, Hasbro bringing um, uh, the game of life to a virtual spinner that interacted with the board game. Well, nobody wanted to play that. 
They either want to play the board game or they want to play something online. So I, I think it's definitely, it's not the wild west of, hey, there's this app store, let's build an app and make a game and see if it works. I think the industry is graduating to how do you have these cross-platform experiences. Skylanders sold $500 million worth of figurines and platform. It was just this astonishing success story That's at retail value in 2012. But 90% of the Mattel had something that went on a, a, a Hot Wheels on a on a pad that translated to the I, to an iPad image, and it just didn't work. So there's a lot of I, I would as gamers I'd encourage everybody to just go shop at Walmart and Target and see what some of the major brands are trying to do. Chances are folks in this room could do it do it even better. A lot of them are really always hung up on how do they leverage their existing equity, their existing brand. It doesn't always translate as well. And her Skylanders, which didn't exist until it became a, its, its own expression of what transmedia can, can do. But force-fitting these historical brands sometimes isn't that great of an idea, but you'll see the technology, you'll see what people are trying to do, and it's interesting. But I think, you know, back to the basics of the business, it's all about creating and engaging play pattern. We feel that we've got that sort of slots and bingo sort of dynamic. Now the question is, how do we keep those eyeballs on our app? How do we introduce achievements? How do we, how do we um, encourage people to spend money uh, and stick around? How do, we, um, how do we effectively recruit new players? I think uh, having published a game and spent a huge chunk of our budget on development and design, uh, we haven't had, we didn't leave a lot in the tank for marketing, and unfortunately, it's pretty tough out there. So, uh, we're experimenting with a lot of things like Facebook Mobile. Facebook Mobile advertising for apps didn't exist until August 2012. Um, so we're just experimenting with that. Um, we're experimenting with traditional uh, third-party distribution and brokerage networks. Uh, we're getting a lot of quotes that are saying it's costing two to two dollars and fifty cents to recruit a new install. And you're looking at figures that if if we were today, we're optimizing and earning money off of our mobile game. We might be lucky to be getting, you know, a, a dollar a year from a player based on what we understand and what we know. So I think partnering, you know, and, and getting the game and having a proof of concept and then, and then looking for and working with partners who know how to acquire efficiently or who have networks that can expose your game to those networks. Those are the kinds of things we're thinking about next. Uh, did anybody have any questions? Uh, did anybody I think we've covered a lot of the topics that we had I think we've covered a lot thought of about getting, we've gone in some other direction. Did anybody have any questions about, about like, you know, have any questions I built about, a game, like, how do I sell it? Like, I built a game, how do I sell it? Like, you know, yeah. Like, along those lines. Yeah. Um, I had an idea a while ago about marketing uh, uh, sales. Uh, a lot of uh, game players don't have any idea how much Uh, the question was basically, you know, how, let me, I'm going to rephrase how you asked it. There's a lot of stuff on the indie side that is open source. We all talk about sharing and, and, you know, sharing our code, sharing our ideas, you know, the collaborative efforts. He was basically asking if you were open in the same way about your books, do we think that that could help? Um, you know, sort of drive sales, you know, sort of like, here's what it costs to make this game, here's what we need to make back, would you like to help with that, and you get sort of a real-time uh, sort of feedback on how sales are doing, is that pretty fair? Yeah. Um, I do think that that, that, that is, if you look at things like Kickstarter, especially these days, a lot of that is becoming more open, you know, the idea of 
okay. sort of the old uh, business cycle of, sort of you know, come up with a concept, you know, proof of concept, get concept, funding, build concept, thing, then sell. Funding, That's kind of how things, things would sort of go. And Kickstarter and Indiegogo and some of these other crowdfunding ideas are changing the way some of these things work. And especially if you actually want to convince people why they should give you money in a Kickstarter, one really good way is to talk about exactly how you expect to use that money. Um, you know, the big companies like the EAs who have, you know, $40 million budgets to build the game and then a $50 million marketing budget, you know, that is a very different kind of a thing than an indie game that wants to spend, you know, maybe $10,000 working part-time to get your game built and out the door. And if you knew you could get 20000 to make it even better, maybe that's when you're going to say to yourself, you know what, I've built a couple of these games, you know, a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand people have played them. I've got a name. Let's go ahead and capitalize on that via Kickstarter and see if I can't get $20,000 to build the exact game that I want to build. And as a result, you're very, very open about it. I think we're seeing that that is working on Kickstarter. The flip side, obviously, of, of that is these few stories. You know, Kickstarter is so new that we're only now just starting to have a couple of these high-profile situations where someone took 80 thousand dollars for a Kickstarter and then didn't deliver and people are starting to wonder you know what what happened there and you know it's it's pretty clear in Kickstarter terms and conditions that like you're not contracting with these people you know you're donating the money to them in exchange for a certain thing if you don't get it such as life but there's gonna be I think some people I don't want to say class action lawsuits, but you know there's definitely been some talk about that for some of these higher profile ones. Um, but I definitely think the idea of being very open about those kinds of things. You know, one thing I've learned a lot. You know, the secret sauce of like, I've got this idea and I'm going to keep it locked down and keep it secret, and that's how I'm going to make my money. In a lot of ways, we're seeing that that's not just not true. You know, open source sharing, community, you know, game jams, all that kind of stuff. It, it creates a virtuous cycle. The more you share, the more open you are, the better everybody does. You know, this place, the Launch House, is built along that. You know, mentoring and and helping people out, and you know, the synergies to use a buzzword, if you'll forgive me, that come from having a lot of people in the room together, sort of talking and bouncing off one another, can lead to a virtuous cycle. And I think that, as a result, I think your idea would probably work out pretty well. Yeah. Anybody else? Steve. Don't do it. <laughs> no, actually, um, there are a few channels there's that, that, that a lot of game companies get started through. There's a traditional toy, corner toy store channel, uh, probably more relevant to this audience. There's a hobby game channel, you know, your corner comic book store that sells some games, strategy games, things like that. There are uh, tried and true. There's there's a there's an industry association called Gamma, uh, G A M A. It's the Game Manufacturers Association or something like that. They're actually based in Columbus and they put on Origins. I'd look into them. The the folks who distribute to all of the corner uh, game stores are out there. There's a lot of folks who are members of Gamma that that are very small publishers. Uh, a lot of those stores are run by hobby gamers, people who have day jobs, people who just got into the, being entrepreneurs because it's their hobby. And of course, the industry is full of, of uh, I think as it was Ian, maybe it was you, Steve, that was saying that a lot of times it's it's that lightning bolt, it's it's the hobby uh, sort of that that just that immersion that, that the, the creativity hits and, and there's suddenly a, a hit title there. And so I, I would never discourage it. We're fortunate, you know. We wanted to get into games. We were selling playing cards. We wanted to get into games. Well, how do you sudden? And, and we had we had vendor numbers at Walmart, Target, you know, all these places. But it's very it's it's ridiculously rare to not be Hasbro or Mattel and be able to launch a game in a, in a major retailer. Games are a so you know what's funny about digital and mobile is some of some of the folks think they invented the social gaming phenomenon, but gaming is social by its very nature. It's one of the top three human social behaviors, right? It's just something people do all the time. And so so um, my point is that games don't show up at Walmart for sometimes four to six years after they've been released because they need word of mouth. Nobody wants to buy a bad game and go ruin the one game night they had with their family. 
so you need to have heard about it. It needs to be something that you've got to know. So actually, Steve, most gamers, most published titles start in those smaller hobby game markets. We were fortunate because you don't need to tell the world what an Ace of Diamonds is on uh, that's sitting on. People think they played with this game when they were little. I mean, it's it's cards on dice. So we had this sort of marketing advantage because what cards on dice are, uh, but. Not all games have that advantage, and they need to start in the smaller segments. And there's plenty of industry information on about it. Origins, Gamma. So. I'll jump in, too, because um, we actually planned with Uncle Slam. We kind of tried to become... We, we tried to follow the Angry Birds model without having Angry Birds. Uh, you know, like at Christmas last year, and the year before even, I bought my kids... You know, there was a kiosk at Beecher Place that was just Angry Birds. An entire kiosk. It was like plushes and puzzles and all this other kind of stuff. So one of the things that we did was after we launched Uncle Slam, we went to um, PAX East, got a booth, and we printed up 500 t-shirts, and we got a bunch of plush eagles that were going to be like the Freedom Eagle, and we were going to sell them. And it was, you know, oh, look at us. You know, we've got this great game. You know, oh, we've got all this merchandising. Oh, it's going to be great. And we sold almost none of it because our brand was not recognized enough at that point that people were like, well, who cares? You know, I mean, uh, we sold we sold a bunch on the novelty of like, you know, the, the, we, we decided to print up t-shirts for four presidents. We did Washington, the dollar bill guy. We did Lincoln, the five dollar bill guy. And we did Obama and Bush figuring, OK, well, you know, someone's going to like and hate one of each of those. And then we've got the two most well-known presidents of the United States and so that was what we had. We sold a few on the novelty of our characters being pretty distinctive looking, but our brand was not like people were not showing up like the way they do for, you know, Fruit Ninja or um, Jetpack Joyride or Angry Birds, where that this was a recognizable thing. We kind of tried we jumped the gun a little bit with the hopes that we would be ready for it, and we lost a lot of money on that, I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> Um, we ended up giving them out as promotional tools at, at the next thing that we went to instead of having to try and sell them. And, you know, that's just one of those things. You know, you live and you learn. Um, so I would say if you're interested in the marketing, um, it costs more for your fans to go this route because, um, you know, one-off printing is more expensive. But places like Cafe Press or Zazzle where you can sort of make a design, put it up, and you only ever pay for it once it's actually been sold. Um, it's, again, sort of that Kickstarter model of, like, you know, I'm going to make this T-shirt with the GameMinder logo available on a website somewhere, but I don't actually have to spend $5,000 buying a bunch of them and warehousing them. I, you know, instead of $20 a shirt, it's going to cost you $29 a shirt for people who want to buy it. But if they're your fans and they really want it, it's a good way to go. So, And it saves you from having to put the money up front. All right, I think we maybe have time for one more question. Anybody? Maybe two. We'll ask. We'll get. We'll let each of you guys ask. Go ahead. We'll talk a little bit about pricing models and how you guys pick the bad ones. Do you believe that the free to play pricing model only works for certain genre of games, or do you think you should try to apply? Yeah, you know it's tricky. Um, I think free to play can be done well. And it could be done very poorly. Um, I think we all know some places that have done it very poorly um, in terms of just being simply exploitative. Um, but, you know, I think what's, what's important to understand about free-to-play is that it's really just a demo. You know, in, in days past, it was called freeware or shareware even. The idea that, like, you get to try it first and then you can decide if you want to buy. What makes free-to-play now with microtransactions slightly different is that it's not you get to demo it and then you give a chunk of money and now you've got the whole thing. It's you're sort of buying it as you go. And um, that is sort of the new, is it, well, it's actually not that new. It's the arcade model. It's pumping quarters into a machine. Um, and, you know, so I think obviously a game like... I think there was some issue recently with like Dead Space 3 that was having some some microtransactions and the people were kind of like, well, this is a little bit lame. Um, you know, I don't know if I like the way that they did this. And that's something you have to be really careful about because I think that, you know, large scale MMOs have been doing the free to play model. Um, but like a single player MMO, if it's the kind of thing where like I'm going to play Skyrim and I don't get all the great armor unless I pony up for it. That's gonna that's gonna put gamers off. So I think I think it could work in any genre. You just gotta do it right. And so I think that's where it becomes a question. You know, I think on iOS we're seeing and Android we're seeing that you can really do innovatively and in an interesting way that's not gonna anger players. You can do free to play in a good way with almost any genre. It's just a question of finding the right way. Yeah, I'll just add to that that. Um, 
that I think the I don't I can't I don't recall the stat, but but free to play is is becoming the de facto. I think it's very hard to get someone to pay a dollar ninety nine to buy it buy an app. There's just too much momentum around free apps. Um, but what we've found and what we learned through talking to some games that are in our genre and some people who have experience, we, we, we couldn't get somebody to pay a dollar ninety nine to download Square Shooters, but we're pretty sure we'll get somebody to spend a dollar or maybe ninety nine cents for an extra dice roll. You know, people will spend money once they're competing, once they're trying to beat their buddy, uh, you know, once they want to accessorize, right? Everybody picked a shirt out today. I mean, they're, they're people like to personalize their game experience. People like to maybe buy probability rules in our case. There's ways in virtual goods that we know we can sell people. Um, I think long term, though, right now, free to play for us is a promotional, it's, it's a promotional strategy for this. So we haven't figured out how to make money with it, but what we understand in our genre is to make money at free to play, we need to gamify the game. We need to give you multiple levels. We need to cause you to have achievements that make you come back. I mean, we, we've got a great game that's got a thrill of victory and a chance dynamic that's appealing. At our 30th day, we're keeping 14 to 15 percent of our customers. Most games are already down to five or six percent, and they're making money at those. The problem we have is at day 60, we're at two percent because we're not gamified and we're not giving people achievements. And, and by by keeping that percentage high, we're we're keeping uh, really the the folks that are spending money, that are engaging in the advertising, that are. And we don't have any of that yet. So we're 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 busy trying to interpret exactly where to go next. But it seems like the industry is centered on free to play. And they're centered on taking a game that's got a great dynamic. First of all, your first thing you need is good retention on your core game dynamic. So it's retention, retention, retention. And then comes uh, monetization and acquisition. So we've got to figure out the monetization piece, but we think it has something to do with that game layer of achievements and, and earnings and currencies. So. You know, I, I, I'm not sure I have enough experience. We're, we're learning, you know, we learned how to spell iOS nine months ago. And uh, so now we're, we've been focused on, first of all, getting a product out that we're proud to cross-promote our analog version. And this retention stuff is, you know, um, we're, we're glad to find out what the stats are and to understand that we're beating those and to understand that, that as far as, you know, our game goes, it's not going to be about... We're not going to be trying to convert people to a paid version. We're, we're going to be trying to uh, deliver this second gamified layer. And so we want that to be part of the first app that people get. So that, you know, so that as you look at the tail of retention where it, where it degrades after 30, 35, 50 days, we want to, we want to make sure we've got um, the ability to retain those players and generate a revenue. So I don't know that that answers your question because I... As, as with lots of things, this is still evolving, and it's evolving quickly. That's the thing about it. You know, when we released Uncle Slam, it was, you know, we were convinced that releasing it at four ninety nine was exactly the right thing to do. And it was, we were wrong, but we were only just wrong. You know, if we had done it two, three months earlier, we might have been right. And it's just, you know, you got to be, it, it's one of those other reasons where, you know, this whole lean startup and lean you know, model is really important because you need to be able to turn on a dime in this. And, you know, as we're starting to learn what some of these retention numbers might mean, you need to be ready to capitalize on that as quickly as possible. And so that's, you know, that's sort of the lesson that we've learned. But unfortunately, we don't know a lot of those numbers because they're still coming out. So. All right, so yeah, so Square Shooters, he's uh, right over here. Uncle Slam is right on the other side of that. Please play it. It's free. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody. It's free. Uh, in this room after this, we've got the, what did you change the name to? Playing by the rules. If you're a game maker and you want to know a little bit about keeping it legal, uh, copyrights, trademarks, privacy policies, all that kind of stuff, uh, Susan Moskowitz here from the Moskowitz Firm is going to be talking about that.